the network. We are now going without uh, a pause uh, into the next uh, panel, which um, uh, Emilia Salvanu of the Greek partner journal uh, Historin um, will uh, moderate. And I'm happy to have you on stage, Emilia. Thanks. <laughs> Hello, thank you all for being here. We are now moving to our next panel about with the title Belonging in Europe, Nation State Solidarity and Sovereignty. I'm happy to have the distinguished uh, panelists here, Professor Jan Plumber from um, uh, Univer uh, Goldsmiths University of London, Su Professor Susan Neyman, uh, uh, the Director of Einstein Forum in Potsdam, and Gary Young uh, from uh, The Guardian. I will shortly introduce each of them and then move directly in the discussion. <laughs> Thank you. So, Jan Plumber is a professor of uh, history at the Goldsmiths University of London, who specializes in Russian history, the history of emotions in the senses, and the history of migration. His last book is Das Neue Sphere, Warum Migration, Das Schuggehort, Ein andere Geschichte der Deutschen. Excuse me for my German, it's not very well. <laughs> and he has also authored The History of Emotions and Introduction and The Stalin Cult, A Study in the Alchemy of Power. Susan Neyman is professor of philosophy and the director of the Einstein Forum in Potsdam. She studied philosophy at Harvard at the Freie Universität of Berlin and was a professor of philosophy at Yale and Tel Aviv University and a member of the Institute of Advanced Study at Princeton. She specializes in moral philosophy, metaphysics, and politics, especially in the 20th and 21st century. She is the author of Slow Fire, Jewish Notes from Berlin, The Unity of Reason, Rereading Kant, Evil in Modern Thought, Fremde Zain Anders, Moral Clarity, A Guide for Grown-Up Idealists, Why Grown-Up, Widerstand der Vernunft, and Manifest in post facts and Zeiten, and learning from the Germans, race and the memory of evil. And Gary Young is a London-based award-winning author and broadcaster and the editor at large for Gather newspaper. He also writes a monthly column for the nation, Beneath the Radar. He reported from America for 12 years and throughout his career has focused on issues of identity, inequality, racism and popular protest around the world. He is the author of the books, No Place Like Home, Stranger is a Strange Land, who Are We?, The Speech, The Story Behind Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s Dream, and most recently, Another Day in the Death of America, a Chronicle of Ten Short Lives. We are very happy and thankful to have you all here. And Gary, you may open the discussion. Thank you. Um, so thank, thank you uh, for uh, inviting me. It's, um, it won't be long before, as a Briton, um, we won't be invited to many things um, in uh, in Europe. I'm, I'm, I recall in 2007 that somebody, uh, when the Belgian government hadn't met for almost a year, somebody put the country on eBay and got 11 million euros before they took it off. I wonder how much Britain would get if they put it on eBay. Um, I want to concentrate on three main things as they apply to this conversation, which hopefully um, can serve as a basis for what we're going to talk about. And they relate most specifically to the situation in Britain and Brexit, but it's broader than that. Because um, there if there's a broad theme here in Britain, it's dishonesty, a false narrative about who we are and who we were and who we might be, and that the debts are finally coming due for that. Now, the first thing I want to concentrate on is immigration. Britain has always been a home to immigrants, but immediately after the Second World War, there was a significant surge. Some came from former colonies, particularly the Caribbean, Australia, South Africa, Africa, and Asia. Though more initially came from elsewhere in Europe, Ireland, Italy, Cyprus, Poland, the Baltic states. Throughout that time, the British political establishment refused to engage intelligently with the issue. For decades, the issue of race, the colour of people, was generally interchangeable with place, the movement of people. 
even when more than half of all black people in Britain were born there, they were still understood as immigrants. The right would brazenly stoke prejudice because they knew that's how they would get votes, and the left would indulge them because they knew that's how they would lose, otherwise they would lose votes. And the upshot was that precious few in the country understood what immigration was for, what drives it, who benefits from it, and why. We did not talk about wars, trade deals, arms sales, environmental devastation, in which we were complicit that made more people move. But nor did we discuss the needs of an aging population, a low wage economy with a creaking welfare state that made us need more people. To provide just one example, the National Health Service make Britons more proud, the National Health Service makes Britain more proud to be British than the monarchy does. It would not be possible without immigrants. By 1971, 12% of British nurses were Irish nationals. And by the turn of the century, 73% uh, of family doctors in the Rhondda Valley in Wales were from South Asia. We were and are ignorant. Three quarters of Britons think immigration should be reduced but then they also think migrants comprise 31% of the country when the actual number is 13%. So no wonder they're scared. If I thought a puppy was more than twice the size of an actual puppy, I might be scared of puppies. When the, British, when the Brexit referendum arrived, we paid the price for all of the hard debates that had been avoided and all the easy roads that had been taken. Second, there is multiculturalism, and in this there is both fact and fiction. The multiculturalism of fact must start from the basis that it has nothing to do with race or religion. Europe is not, and never has been, a monoculture or a monoethnicity. If you took all the black and brown people out of Europe and all the non-Christians, it would still be multicultural. Look at what is happening in Catalonia right now. Take a look at what might happen in Scotland if, Brit if Britain left the European Union. Take a look at Belgium and Wallonia and Flanders. For more successful examples, look at the multilingual Swiss, the regional variations in Italy, the revival of the Welsh language and the issues with the border in Ireland. Europe, uh, when it comes to race and religion, Europe has great examples of success and important examples of failure but none of them are particular to the issues of race and religion. The multiculturalism of fiction, however, is the notion that a there is a liberal state-led policy of encouraging and supporting cultural difference at the expense of national cohesion. In most of Europe, no such coordinated policies ever existed. In many places where what is called multiculturalism is being read its last rites, it never actually lived in its professed form. But references to it are everywhere, stirring moral panic over so-called liberal dilemmas, which then counterpose diversity and solidarity, as though they stand in contradiction and conflict. Just for one example, take the decision in September 2005 of the Danish newspaper Jyllandsposten to publish over 12 cartoons, some of which depicted the Prophet Muhammad. Uh, uh, which depicted the Prophet Muhammad, some of which were deeply offensive. Now, of course, Yiland Poston absolutely had the right to publish those um, uh, cartoons. Uh, but then we get to the question of were they right to publish those cartoons? And you hear from uh, uh, Fleming Rose at the time, who says, this is a far bigger story than just the question of 12 cartoons. He's the culture editor. It's about the question of integration and how compatible the religion of Islam is with a modern secular society. And he was right in one sense. It was a far bigger story. It's just not the one that he was selling. Because just two years earlier, a Danish illustrator, Christopher Zeller, submitted a series of unsolicited cartoons offering a lighthearted take on the resurrection of Christ. And he received an email from the paper saying, I don't think Yolande Poston's readers will enjoy the drawings. As a matter of fact, they will provoke an outcry, and therefore we will not use them. The question whether, wasn't whether you could or should draw a line when it comes to religious tolerance and freedom of expression, but where you draw it, and who counts and who doesn't. 
The bigger story here was about the notion of integration as it is understood in the current Western model. Namely, who are you trying to integrate? What are you trying to integrate them into? And on what basis? Since the turn of the century, this century, the establishment in Britain stoked fears about whether British culture could withstand the integration of Muslims, when they might have been more worried about how to integrate the white working class into the British economy. Muslims voted 70% to stay in the European Union. The white working class did not. And finally, there is empire. And I am minded here of the Danish finance minister, Christian Jensen, who said, there are two kinds of European nations. There are small nations, and there are countries that have not yet realized that they are small nations. Britain is the latter. And this painful Brexit process is teaching us how small we are. Since Suez, Britain has struggled with its place in the model world. Nostalgic about its former glory, anxious about its diminished state, forgetful about its former crimes, bumptious about its future role. It has lived on its reputation as an elderly aristocrat might live on his trust fund, frugally and pompously, with a great sense of entitlement and precious little self-awareness. Brexit was in part an expression of this. They wanted to put the great back into Great Britain. But that is not a plan, it is a slogan and a delusional one at that. When it came to negotiations, they assumed that Britain would dictate the terms. It couldn't. They assumed they could just walk away. They couldn't. They had more, no more plans for leaving the European Union than a dog chasing a car has to drive it. And they are now finding out how little sovereignty means for a country the size of Britain in a neoliberal globalized economy beyond blue passports, which are made in France anyway. <laughs> All European states struggle, I believe, with the first two challenges of the notions of immigration and multiculturalism as it relates to candor, anti-racism, pluralism, and inclusion. The latter, empire, is the burden of a few former colonial powers, primarily France, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Portugal, each of whom struggles with their dishonesty in their own way. But finally, all of this has taken place most recently in a period where nation states have struggled to assert their will as a primary democratic entity against the might and scale of neoliberal globalization, a system that ensures that whomever you vote for, capital always gets in. And most recently, during a massive economic crash in which the poorest paid most for the follies and the greed of the wealthy. These two are general problems, not particular to Britain. However bizarre Britain appears, and I'm aware that it does appear bizarre, it would be hubristic of those outside of Britain to think that the four horsemen of modern day European political culture nationalism, racism, alienation, and nostalgia do not stalk the rest of the continent. The crisis, said the Italian Marxist Antonio Gramsci, consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. And in this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Brexit is a symptom of a broader crisis affecting us. And in that sense, we are more European than we would like to admit. Thank you. So, yes, this is on. Um, I am going to respond to some of the points that Gary just made. I think we're largely in agreement. But my differences will be questions of tone. We're actually supposed to talk about culture in this panel and not about um, material basis. That's for the uh, late afternoon lecture. But as we discussed at lunch, um, they're deeply related, um, even if you're not a Marxist and certainly if you're not uh, a reductionist, as I am not. I want to think a little bit about the ways in which dishonesty is furthered by interests. Interests that Gary, of course, mentioned uh, more or less obliquely at several points. 
you know, we all have a tendency not to look at our flaws. That's deeply human, whether it's personal or national. But I think what we're talking about right now uh, is the ways in which dis or what I'd like to talk about is the ways in which dishonesty has been so strongly furthered by a neoliberal global culture since 1989, and it doesn't it didn't have to work out that way. We had the example in the Polish case of the hostility towards refugees going up dramatically. That was a subject of of the last panel discussion. Um, it wasn't mentioned when we talked about the breakup of the former Yugoslavia that <clears throat> Milosevic played on what are indeed, as Professor Schlogel mentioned, you know, age old um, nationalist divisions, but sometimes they're exploited and sometimes they're not. Think about the fact that if you had asked five years ago whether immigration was a major issue in the United States, you would have had very few takers to that proposition. And Donald Trump has built an entire presidency on uh, a, a set of lies about immigrants. Um, again, the United States, unlike European countries, was a nation built on a myth about immigration. And when the Trump administration starts wanting to rewrite Emma Lazarus's poem, which is at the base of the Statue of Liberty, you know that something has been reversed. It's um, so. Um, let's see. I made a bunch of notes here. The question is why we don't fight more for words like solidarity, why multiculturalism, as Gary said, is a kind of placeholder, but um, nothing that anybody's prepared to actually stand up and give some content to. And I think certainly one of the reasons is that we don't have a notion of internationalism anymore, nor do we have a notion of solidarity. Both of those words feel in the West and perhaps even more in the East contaminated since 1989. Um, what we have is globalism, which is, of course, a completely different phenomena. It's a claim about the universality of needs. It's not a claim about the universal, as in everybody needs an iPhone um, <laughs> or needs Amazon to bring whatever to their door. It's not a claim about any other f uh, form of universality, a universality of rights, a universality of interests. It's all interests have been reduced to one. I have the same problem with the word tolerance, which is often mentioned uh, in connection with multiculturalism. Tolerance is, uh, it's actually a horrible word, because if you think about when we use it in ordinary language, we tolerate those things which we don't like, headaches, noise, uh, smell in the uh, subway, and moreover, things which we are powerless to do anything about. So that I think the minute that people ask uh, their neighbors to be more tolerant, they're not only um, um, reminding them of uh, a set of negative values, but they're reminding them of their own powerlessness. And, um, you know, so my plea, which is uh, I realize, uh, particularly in this moment of commemoration of 1989, a rather freighted one, is that one of the things we need to do is, is uh, redefine words like solidarity and internationalism. I'm going to say a word about colonialism, which I agree with you entirely, is something that um, Britain completely failed to look at. 
I was in Britain about six weeks ago uh, at the publication of my book, Learning from the Germans, and twice in two different television programs, I was told, oh, but that can't possibly uh, have any... Um, and learning from the Germans refers to the ways in which I think Germany has to some degree faced its past unevenly with difficulties, slowly, reluctantly. Um, it's actually the failures of the German Vergangenheitsaufarbeitung which have proven an interesting example to other countries who are beginning or small uh, small populations in other countries are beginning to do that. But I was told in Britain, oh, but that has nothing to do with us. The Nazis were uh, interested in world domination. <laughs> to, <laughs> to which it fortunately occurred to me to say the first time I was told this, I thought the sun never set on the British Empire. Um, so, uh, you know, in, in all of those ways, I agree with you entirely that um, there is an enormous amount of dishonesty going on. And sadly enough, it's people on the left who know about that dishonesty, who are often the strongest critics of Europe, and the people who are um, least willing to actually um, present an idealistic vision of Europe because they know the flaws. And I think that's the point at which we decided I should hand the microphone over to Jan, who wants to talk about that question. I'll try. Um, thank you. Um, so, so yesterday uh, we had the, we had Elida Osman, uh, Osman, we had the arresting image of uh, the empty sacred center in the center of the stars. Uh, the European um, flag. Um, and um, I think part of the business of this panel will be to uh, try and offer some thoughts about um, how this might be done. So so the panel following us is uh, the panel on hard economics, as it were. It's on, on uh, it's the economy, stupid, or it's the economy Europe, and ours is is it might be entitled it's the emotions uh, Europe or it's the emotions stupid and the two are connected uh, in fundamental ways they're not in opposition to each other as we all learned in 2008 with um, the world financial crisis when uh, a rational choice etc uh, proved that they were not uh, rational at all um, okay so we've got that We've got very little by way of imaginaries about uh, filling that symbolic center, symbolic emotional center uh, of, of Europe. Um, uh, but interestingly, we also, there's also very little uh, for the country that we're in at the moment. Um, Germany uh, has a, a, a concept of um, a nationhood that is still, um, very much ethnobiological, uh, ethno-national, much more so than other European uh, concepts of nationhood. Uh, it is one that is uh, not uh, fully a concept of civic uh, nationhood, um, and that's for a whole host of reasons. Um, but one of them, I think, is that um, uh, the left or progressives uh, have shied away from trying and participate in the process of um, offering something, of trying to uh, define it. Um, and that's understandable. It's, it's, um, uh, it's a function of uh, Nazism. Um, it's understandable that that's uh, contaminated, but it's come to haunt us, uh, I believe. It's falling on our feet. Um, and other people are making very attractive, um, uh, are offering very attractive uh, models. I'll just mention a couple. Uh, one is from the far right um, with the AFD in this country. Uh, another is um, from um, uh, countries of origin of German citizens uh, who uh, I think in, I have in mind in particular Turkey, Erdogan's uh, Turkey and uh, Putin's Russia. Um, who, um, in reversing older concepts of um, their nationhood, have turned to ethnobiological, ethnocultural, ethno-religious uh, concepts of, 
models of, of um, nationhood. Um, and in the absence of anything um, by way um, uh, uh, of uh, uh, Germany, um, these German citizens turn to uh, these alternative uh, concepts, which in a changed media situation with uh, social media, satellite television, et cetera, um, have, a, have the power to spread much more quickly and much more powerfully um, than they used to. So, so um, you know, I've, I never thought uh, I'd ever invest any intellectual energy in my life uh, in trying to define the nation, but um, I feel that, that the time has come where we ought to do this. Um, and I see that project as in parallel with trying to imagine um, symbolically, emotionally, um, Europe. Um, and so, so uh, you know, the, the, the interesting thing is that um, I think humanity hasn't come up uh, with anything better than the salad bowl model where you can uh, belong, um, you can have various types of ties um, in your identity, but you, can, you also have uh, one that belongs to the civic nation that you uh, belong to. Most people at least do, some to two or three, but anyway, um, it's a fact of life for most people. And, and so we need a, uh, a concept of, of plural um, uh, uh, forms of belonging or identities, um, of deeply performative forms of belonging. As you do it, as you say things, as you perform something, they change, they get reformatted, uh, et cetera. And they, they need to be able to go together. The problem now is, at, in this country, that um, you uh, cannot be um, uh, of Turkish descent uh, and German. Uh, it's it's either or. That's still that's still the fact. Um, and it's there are numerous manifestations I could go into them. It, just use one. Uh, the 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 name used to designate uh, people say of Turkish origin is um, is uh, uh, German Turks, Deutsch Türken, rather than um, Turkish Germans, uh, Turco Germans or um, anything. So it's it's an adjective, even though they're uh, civic belonging, civic national belonging is. Um, is to Germany. Um, so I think we, we, we need something, um, and uh, what is that supposed to do? I think, uh, I think we ought to trust in democratic processes and in the power that they develop uh, as we do them. So I would never offer any kind of content-wise definition of what's going to go in there, but I have in mind stuff, I could speculate, I have in mind stuff, for instance, like a naturalization ceremony or a uh, museum for um, uh, Germany as a country of immigrants. Because this is the interesting thing. If you turn to history, you see that post-45, uh, Germany uh, is a country that's a country of immigrants. You've got 12 and a half million expellees from the East who are considered completely other as they arrive. The racism, Nazism are applied to them. Um, these people of Silesians, etc. You've got uh, 14 million so-called guest workers, labor migrants, from all over the place, uh, um, uh, only um, three million stay, 11 million go back. You've got um, people uh, of ethnic German descent um, up to three million from the former Soviet Union, from Poland, from uh, Romania. You've got asylum seekers um, and many, many more. Um, so the, 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 the obvious fact is uh, that it's always been part of the story. And one of the, now, how can we think of imaginaries um, that are new and different. Um, so one of the elements of that would have to be, I think, uh, definitely telling a story of migration. And this is something that's, that can be generalized and universalized uh, on a pan-European uh, level, that, that uh, you scratch in any kind of biography, any kind of family biography, individual biography, if you go, long, if you go back uh, long enough, you'll find um, migration. Uh, forced migration, voluntary migration, usually uh, reasons are very difficult to, um, to uh, differentiate, but it, it, it's part of that. Um, so I think that should be definitely um, um, be, be part of it. Um, there, so, so 1989, to me, um, also means something else. It means um, the end of uh, creating such imaginaries, investing in such imaginaries. It's the end of uh, utopianism, right? And, and it's interesting, to, this morning we heard um, Karl Schlögel um, and, and uh, we heard a very uh, powerful um, 
uh, plea to not think in terms of systems and in terms of larger um, uh, expansionary models, and certainly not in terms of uh, the vision thing, what um, uh, uh, one American president called the vision thing. Um, and, but that's part of the biography as well. You know, uh, I, I think part of the biography has to be um, when you tell, when you, if you were to tell your uh, autobiography, I think um, your communist, Maoist, uh, West German past would be part of this and 1989 as an end to, or breaking with, it started earlier with you, but um, an end to this kind of utopian thinking. And, and this is, I think, where we need to go again. Of course, knowing about the, the dangers, uh, but still we need to invest in in um, utopian thinking. So I'll just pick on a couple of elements um, that might feed into this. So did you know, for instance, that um, in 2011, uh, both Ukraine and Russia uh, joined something called a Euregio, a Euregio, uh, and they joined the Association of European Border Regions, uh, and they got money from the EU in order to clean up um, the Don River. It was the it's the Donbas uh, Eurasia. So that's a very it's it's a it's a model. Why do we talk about um, Brexit and the Nor Northern Irish issue only in terms of what might happen? It's an incredible success story. The fact that this conflict, which seemed as intractable as the Arab-Israeli conflict, um, that this conflict has been diffused for so long, this is an unbelievable success story. And you see it as an export model um, that, that, that's, that, that can certainly be exported to, to um, uh, other parts of Europe. Uh, Donbass, Eurasia was one example. That didn't work, but still, it can work. That would be one, um, um, one um, uh, point to be, uh, to be made. Um, so uh, I guess the, 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 uh, the uh, issue would be, um, to think hard about how to create um, national, symbolically, emotionally charged imaginaries, uh, and how these then, in the end, might fit together in a in a European uh, one. Because uh, the way they are, they're still very different. You've got many that are based, predicated on victimhood, others on heroism. Uh, you got the German exceptionalism, uh, as as Susan detailed in her in her uh, last book. Um, but how are we going to bring this together? But still, I think it, it, it's worth investing energy in, in, in doing this. I just want to respond to that very quickly because I'm entirely on the same side as you are, Jan. If, it would, if you're looking for a deep disagreement, I think it's not going to be on this panel. Um, but I think you're undermining the project from the start by using words like utopian and imaginary. Utopia, as you know, as well as anybody, I'm sure, means nowhere. And imaginary it has the same thing. I think what's been lost since, or what seemed contaminated since 1989 is the word ideal, because ideal is not, uh, and I, I mean, ideals get realized, and we've seen them uh, be realized. And uh, if state socialism uh, committed any sin, I mean, it committed a number of sins, but as far as I'm concerned, the worst sin it committed was to create general international cynicism about the power of ideals. So I think if you're, you know, if you're working to create that, maybe it's my training as a philosopher, but I think we need to be you know, just as careful about not using words like imaginary as not using tolerance. Um, the other thing that I just wanted to give you as an example of something that actually works in uh, in this country, at least in uh, the district Neukölln. Um, I have lived here for a terribly long time and did not actually decide to apply for German citizenship until Donald Trump was elected uh, president of the United States. And I was fortunate enough 
to um, get my citizenship in Neukölln, where I live, when Franziska Giffey, who fortunately did not officially plagiarize her dissertation, and so will remain with us as a, a social democratic minister and presumably quite a bit more for a long time, she was simply regional mayor. And she constructed a ceremony. I know this is hers because I've talked to other friends who were naturalized, and it was quite different, where the beginning was there were 48 uh, new Germans from 22 countries. And there was a violin and a piano playing snippets of the national anthems of all of those countries, which made for rather a long ceremony. Then, but, but it was quite moving. And she talked about the importance of music and saying, you know, you're not losing your old identity, you're getting a, a new one. And then we were all supposed to get up and sing... Um, <clears throat> Um, I, I know it's not Deutschland über alles, but um, that, the problem is, is is that for 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 non Germans that's what it comes it comes out as, and uh, and the the Europe hymn and the Beethoven. So um, you know there are attempts like this, and I think coming I I don't think it's that hard to do the kind of you know multicultural citizenship that you're talking about um, or multiple identities. I mean, we all have multiple identities. Uh, I just think we have to be really careful about what words we use and what words we avoid. I just... Um, is this working? Yeah. Just coming off the back of that, I think that there is... There's a problem that liberals on the left have, which is that the right... Uh, when it comes to imagination and um, uh, to a grand narrative, the right has no problem right. manufacturing uh, kind of uh, uh, an entirely um, uh, dishonest, false notion of monoethnicity, of kind of uh, of a kind of a nationhood that's frozen at a certain point in time. In Britain, that's just after the war. In other countries, it will be a different time that they then imagine themselves back to. So with Brexit, there's been a lot of war imagery. It's like the Blitz, you know, people say, and it's like, look, but we're declaring war on ourselves. This is not a kind of, this is not, and actually, it was an awful time. It was a terrible thing to recreate. Whereas the left, I feel, um, they have a different story to tell. It's a different story of cosmopolitanism and diversity and of internationalism, and, but they don't like to tell it. They're kind of embarrassed by it, and they, they don't sufficiently believe in it in order to kind of take it out there and, and actually galvanize people on the basis that, you know, we, we are more than just ourselves. And this was one of the features of the Brexit campaign which was that one side was attacking the EU and the other side did not defend the EU or defend cosmopolitanism or defend the kind of, you know, what is beautiful about the fact that people can travel. They just kind of, uh, they just shut up about it. Which is a different way of saying is there is a response, there is an answer to the, um, uh, to the rights notion of a fictitious na nationhood, but we have to believe in that answer ourselves before we can take them on. Quick question, how much do you think that the left-wing embarrassment has to do with 1989 and the contaminations of words like international solidarity? Because I think a lot. I don't think that the left uh, has faced that problem yet. And, um, you know, the, uh, this is anecdotal, but it's not unimportant. Uh, we at the Einstein Forum were interested last year in getting someone who was an expert on North Korea to talk about the memory of the Korean War and how that was affecting politics, uh, contemporary politics in North Korea. So we found someone. And the first thing that he did when he got to uh, our um, 
auditorium or our room uh, in Brandenburg was to talk about how moved he was to be in the former East Germany because after the Korean War, when uh, more bombs were dropped than in the entire Second World War, he said it was East German engineers who came in the name of international solidarity to build up North Korea. So, I mean, there are memories of words like international solidarity not simply being, uh, you know, uh, instrumentalized for, uh, um, you know, repressive purposes. And I just wonder if you think that's the source of our embarrassment. Because I do, but I you mean, have I, a different view. I don't, very, very quickly. I, do, I don't just because I... Th I mean, I'm sure that's part of it, but I also think that there is... Uh, it comes from a deeply parochial place that doesn't want to kind of reach out to the rest of the world because one can um, uh, use, for example, I don't know, Mandela or the Dalai Lama or... The, it's not like there aren't um, objects of... Uh, aspiration out there that we can use um, to kind of claim an international, a notion of international solidarity. Interestingly, even Obama, you know, and um, America, not known as the kind of place, you know, you know hey, we can, but when Obama was elected, there was a, there was a notion of the world kind of rallying, you know, people just wished he was their president instead, or as well. Well, the Irish actually claimed him, by the way. They have a national monument in the place of his um, uh, great-great-grandfather on his mother's side birth. The Irish claim everybody. <laughs> well, uh, people are trying to do that with not just international solidarity, but also with anti-fascism. Um, there's an attempt to reconquer the term and use it as a, um, as a uniting um, principle and its history. Um, See, I think part of the realization of uh, the past couple of years is that um, we've done all this uh, analysis of, uh, you know, metaphors of uh, dehumanizing human beings and so on. And uh, the realization is that, that there's a reservoir of this that's extremely easy to activate, um, uh, to tap into. Uh, there's... Uh, 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 the, 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 the amount of muck uh, is so immense, so enormous, and it's so easy to activate. So I think in order to uh, develop counter strategies, um, uh, we need to be so much more um, expansive and, 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 um, and uh, creative um, than we think. I, I think I use the term to think from an Archimedean point that's outside the here and now. I, I use the term utopia as well, but uh, I don't think um, that's a problem. I think uh, none of the progressive changes would have ever happened without, uh, I think women would still not be voting had not somebody thought uh, from an Archimedian, Archimedian point outside the, um, the here and now. And um, on the issue of migration, personally, uh, and, and from um, um, looking at migration studies, I can see how uh, you cannot be um, pro open borders. Um, the, ultimately, I think it's it's going to be very difficult to uh, not have a definition of the sovereign as uh, global humanity. You know, if 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 the way we live here has effects in in, in Bangladesh and the Ganges Delta, um, but. Um, flooding them and eventually making their basis of living impossible. And if they vote with their feet and come here, well, that's uh, the expression. They're more than us. There's about 160, 80, uh, 60 million Bangladeshis. There's about 80 million Germans. That's a different uh, notion of, of uh, sover sovereignty. And ultimately, I can't see how you cannot deny, um, how you cannot define uh, mobility as a truly um, universal um, uh, human right. Now, how we get there in the intermediate stages, a lot will have to happen, right? They'll, they'll have to... Um, well, one, one of the things would be to... to um, I mean, there's some good practical things that are out there, so you can, you can actually um, use, for instance, um, 
uh, amnesties, you can naturalize, mass naturalize people uh, who are without papers in Europe, who've made it to Europe, but have been living here and working here. That's one of the things uh, you can do. You can do, you can regulate migration in different ways than it's being done uh, now. Um, of course, you need to have consensus for that, but I think still thinking from an Archimedean point um, that's uh, far removed is, is the only way to go. I, I was intrigued by how quickly, before 1989, one of the more obvious sins as it was, as it was sold in the West was that these people can't move, that these exactly. people can't leave. How terrible is that, that they can't get out? And then as soon as the wall came down, there was this sense of like, well, don't come here, you know? And, um, uh, and the notion of uh, free movement was absolutely kind of uh, embraced, so long as it wasn't possible. And as soon as it became possible, then uh, 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 a kind of, where well, the politics kept them out, the economics, then the economics kept them out. But that um, it, it shows that there is a world where you can make that case. Uh, uh, in that case, it was a case against communism, but there's a, there's a case that you can make more broadly. I was intrigued by, by the use of the word embarrassment for, uh, for giving alternative narratives. And, <clears throat> okay, I uh, thought about melancholia, traverse term of melancholia of the left, and uh, collective guilt. And it reminded me, I was doing research of uh, the 1960s in Greece, a strict anti-communism state, repressive. And it said that being a communist is incompa incompatibly racially with being Greek. You can't be, I mean, it's, you can't imagine yourself as Greek and a communist is a different race. And for our discussion here, I was thinking, can we imagine, I mean, after 89, and after the uh, neoliberalism being a new truth regime around Europe, can we imagine a different Europe based on socialist uh, ide uh, ideals, or are we too embarrassed to voice it? It's funny. Um, I didn't realize that was the case in Greece, but it sounds almost American. I mean, in American uh, in culture, until extremely recently, when Bernie Sanders rehabilitated the notion of socialism, even though it's not quite what we would consider socialism. In fact, I have to tell Americans that uh, Sanders is quite to the left of, uh, to the right of Merkel in terms of what he actually proposes. Um, but it, the idea that you couldn't be a communist, in fact, the anti-communist committee was called the House on american Activities Committee, although there was a communist movement and a communist tradition in the United States. Uh, I think what Europe needs to realize with all the um, you know, due understanding of the differences between East and West and North and South economically, is actually we're a proto-socialist continent compared to the rest of the world. And if you're talking about ideals that we might fill the center with, Jan, uh, I think the idea that things like education, health care, uh, parental leave, paid vacation are not as they're considered in the US, but also in India or China or Brazil. They are not benefits, they're rights. And you know, I, I think Europeans often tend to lose the big picture on that. Of course, you know, social structures have been cut. Of course, they're differences between countries. But nevertheless, there's a conceptual commitment to the idea of those things as rights uh, that I think Europeans need to stand up for at the same time that they're expanding the rights and making sure that they're equal between the different countries. Because simply s being pro-European, but saying, uh, well, it means we haven't had a war in 75 years, if you forget about the former Yugoslavia, um, that's simply not enough of a positive vision. And I do think that a rethought socialism is. And that came, came through with what Gary said and the pride that Brits take in the, Britain's take in the NHS. 
So it's the social welfare state. Um, but but there is an economic underbelly, right? Uh, the social welfare state has lived through enormous cuts uh, when uh, uh, neoliberalism post-1989 went on steroids. Um, so it's part of reconquering that whole uh, generation. It's not going to work without uh, the R word. The, the biggest taboo is redistribution. That's, uh, that's going to have to be part of it as well. But we saw the the imbrication of uh, sort of emotional symbolic attachment that came through the poll that you cited, um, and and a very concrete, real, uh, very concrete, real kinds of safeguards that we enjoy as uh, citizens uh, of this continent. It's going to have to. There's going to have to be an open conversation about migration and the social welfare state, um, one that doesn't shy away from the difficult and hard. Uh, issues because if 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 uh, more people try and get in, um, uh, the cake is going to get smaller. But um, it's a conversation I'd rather have uh, than not have. But the social welfare state may well be one of the um, key candidates for that uh, emotional symbolic center in the European Union. I think we slowly have to wrap the, the conversation between us and open the floor for uh, a general discussion. So the floor is open. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Erhard Pusseg. I'm from Austria, Vienna. Uh, my first remark is uh, we had a discussion in the past, a long time ago. Are we a nation, we Austrians? And the answer was no. I think we tried to overbridge it and we're saying we are a cultural nation, whatever it means. So far, I'm extremely critical to the title, but under other auspices, I think belonging in Europe should sound nation state, sovereignty, solidarity, uh, and global responsibility. Because this will be the tremendous change which will happen in politics if you want it or not. I'm not from the Green Party. I'm wondering that it is not coming up here in this room because I think uh, mainly it's connected with the Greens. Uh, but it was not mentioned. Interesting for me. Okay. Uh, no, I hear in this discussion at the panel, no. Huh? Nobody, yeah? Uh, but th this will be the real problem. I think if we are looking to the uh, ecological problems, I think there will be no nation state. There will be no sovereignty, and hopefully there will the solidarity. And I think therefore we have to change for sure the direction. Uh, I'm extremely critical of the command, uh, leftist, rightist. I think it would be a question of movement concerning uh, who is able to, to guarantee the future uh, in reality. There are other movements coming up here uh, on this subject, and this will change our political system uh, totally. You can forget the nation state under the auspices. I'm responsible for the River Danube. It's the second largest river of uh, uh, Europe. Uh, the biggest is Volga, but along the Volga they are living uh, totally all the Russians. Uh, along the River Danube we have 14 nations. Huh? So far, concerning looking to the water problems uh, of the Danube, there is no nation state. I think it is forgettable in reality that we are living uh, with nation states. I think we have to face the fact that we Europeans are 7% of the global population. That's not too much. And it will go down by our birth rate. Uh, we are 20% uh, of the results of, of economy, and it will go down because India is coming up, China is coming up, and so on and so on. And we are consuming 50% of the uh, uh, welfare uh, of the whole world. And th that's for sure not possible. That will be the tremendous change. So uh, I think uh, you can really forget a lot of expressions here uh, used because it will be changed, maybe not by us, if we are not doing it in time, but by pressure. The Roman Empire was also ruined by migration, for sure. Uh, but they did, didn't decide upon. They believed in the Roman Empire, but it was ended. 
I think that might be the situation which we having are if we are not facing here on the problems uh, totally existing. So far, we are missing a little bit the real subject of our existence. Beg your pardon for this warning, but this is the reality. If you are listening to the tones which are given by some representative of the ecological uh, movement, I think it is very radical. And maybe I'm not quite sure that some parties will survive this situation. Uh, it wasn't the subject of this discussion, but I'm glad that you brought it up because uh, the only way, it seems to me, that we could create the kinds of um, structures that we're talking about, changing the nation state, uh, open borders, and in particular, uh, redistribution, um, strikes me, no, it doesn't strike me. The only chance we have is turning around a capitalist ideology in which growth is the ideal by which uh, any government is measured, okay? And it may be the case... Yeah, right. But, gr I, mean, it's, I mean, this is one of the ways in which I think that capitalism has... Um, you know, colonized so many forms of language and so many expressions because who wants to be against growth, right? But the assumption that growth is unrestricted consumption, production for unrestricted consumption, the one thing that might lead to the sorts of ideals that we're talking about here is consciousness of the ecological catastrophe. I d yeah, I don't think this, these things are exclusionary. I think you, if you have a notion, a concept of plural uh, forms of belonging, plural identities, then uh, you know one may be local, another may be regional, a third may be uh, on the level of the nation state, and then the one uh, might be supranational ones. Uh, the EU and ultimately uh, a world federation at some point. Uh, clearly, uh, most of the global problems can only be solved globally. Um, but I don't see why. They need to be, why the terms of the debate need to be uh, set up in, uh, as an opposition, as a dichotomy. And I, I guess I, I would say nation states do exist. I mean, we know that because you've got a passport and I've got a passport. And if you didn't have a passport and if you couldn't have a passport, you would really, really not be saying nation states aren't important. I mean, Austria. nation states are really important. Well, Austria is a complicated yeah. example. Well, it's, it's not in so far as it's a state and it provides a passport. If you were, sorry, hang on. If you were, le, le, if you were stateless, you would see the point of a nation state. If you were a refugee or an asylum seeker, you would see the point of a nation state. And it happens to be the only democratic entity that we have, and so we have to work with it. Obviously, it's imperfect and it's incapable. And I was saying there, whoever you vote for, capital gets in, there is a limit to what the nation state can do. But we have, we have not come up with a higher form of democratic entity. And you try, you try and cross a border without the papers and you see the nation state kick in. There are hundreds of thousands of people around the world dying because of nation states. So we're not there yet. We are in that interregnum that Gramsci spoke about. Nation states still matter. And to the extent to which they still matter and the extent to which they can do a lot of damage, we have to kind of intervene as best we can in them. Hello. I will stand up so you can see me. Um, I, I want to comment on the exchange between um, Jan and Susan on the, the, the term imaginaries. Actually, I, I agree with Jan and, um, that imaginaries, um, imaginary or imagination is not a mere fantasy. This is uh, towards the objection of Susan. Imagination is also performative. Uh, it, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, affects policy making. The example, historical examples, uh, long before we could fly, there was imaginations of flying. Long before there were uh, 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 submarines, there were imaginations of, 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 of deep sea, you know, uh, uh, traveling or exploration. 
So imagination is performative and it, it affects policies and uh, and uh, so and, and and I really like uh, Jan's uh, uh, how how he put that uh, we we should produce imaginaries uh, or or it's my own words that uh, is more inclusive and sees a future that is inclusive. So that was a comment, but my question now. Um, and this is a good discussion because it's on, on, on the meaning of words, the meaning of, for example, integration. There are discuss, discussion that integration, although I'm not an, an English native speaker, uh, integration means that uh, there are a group of people coming to a country, finding a home, uh, then you integrate into the, what's given into, to you. So integrate to the, you go to a house, so you integrate into, the rules and everything, and much of the effort uh, in in Europe or or, or uh, my uh, 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 the migrants receiving countries has been to teach them uh, uh, about what they have. Uh, these countries have the rules. Teach them about the rules, how to integrate into the society. So there has been less effort on. T uh, about how to learn or how to integrate their culture, uh, their, their, what, what these immigrants have, uh, uh, have to offer. That's why maybe, I, imagine, I, I guess, that's why maybe they, they don't feel that strong sense of belonging to, to Europe, or they don't even sense that ownership. Uh, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, maybe, the integration term, maybe could we think about another term that is also uh, uh, g giving thought to, uh, to what the, the other side, the, 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 the migrants can also, you know, uh, offer, not just integrate them into what these receiving countries have and the rules here are. I mean, just because I use the word in my speech, I'll, I'll answer. That was my point, that where the issue of who is asked to integrate, on what basis, and why. That if you go to, if you look at the states, the Amer America, pre um, uh, pre civil rights, the South was not actually segregated insofar as white people slept with black people, they had them living in their house. Um, they were usually their first friend until they got to uh, a certain age. The itch, their nurse, they, they breastfed them. The issue wasn't whether they could mix, it was on what basis. So it was not about mixing, it's about power. And so when the, the, the example I gave of we are gonna integrate you into a racist society. We are gonna integrate you into a society where you drop your cultural needs and for that, we give you what? Acceptance. And also, kind of, mostly conversation revolves around integrating people into culture and nothing else. So we're gonna integrate you into a country that can't house you, won't educate you, um, uh, won't employ you, and will uh, demean you. Well, who wants that? And what, so the, I think the issue is who is asked to integrate, because also the other thing is that when one group of people move physically, everybody moves culturally. So in Britain, um, Indian uh, restaurants employ more people than shipbuilding, coal and steel all put together. Britain's changed, and that is, uh, and that is a, a form of integration. So we have to imagine Everybody has to imagine themselves differently, but the heavy lifting is all too often put on the shoulders of the weakest people, the people who've just come, or the people who have the least resources but look different, act different, pray different. So the, 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 I don't know enough about the uh, integration terminology in, in other languages than uh, German, but in Germany, the debate is, is framed exactly as you say, and just to spell it out, um, there's the idea of a homogenous something, uh, not a hybridic something, right? But a homogenous something. Uh, and then those who come are supposed to become part of that homogenous something, which usually means um, it's a very exclusionary discourse as well. You have to accept uh, equality of um, uh, men and women. That's so. No, they 
they sh that, that's a different that's a different issue. But um, I'm just telling about how the debate is framed usually. Okay, um, and then once you try and do that in this country, once you try and become part of it, uh, whenever you think you've made it, they don't t really tell you what it is exactly that you need to do. But whenever you think you've made it, it's like a carrot that they dangle in front of you. And whenever ever you think you make it, they turn it, they t pull it away. No, sorry, uh, try again. Uh, good try. So it, that's, a, that's an exclusionary uh, way of talking about it. But I think the, the term is in such circulation uh, in this society that um, it needs to be redefined. Many people are doing the work of redefining it. Uh, it can be, it's not lost, it can be reconquered. So I think we're stuck with the term um, in German, but, um, but clearly it has that kind of uh, ring that you described, that you mentioned. Just a word to the comment about uh, my views about the word imaginary. I think your example works extremely well for airplanes and submarines and other kinds of technological feats that were indeed um, you know, realized through feats of imagination. I'm not so sure that it works for things like equal justice for women and people of color and LGBTQ people. I mean, I, I feel like the word ideal is the one that we're most embarrassed to use. Imagination is, well, yeah, and, and let's even forget John Lennon. Um, imagination sounds okay, but ideal it, it scares us off, and I think it shouldn't. Um, I, oh, I'm sorry. From a um, particular Swiss perspective, I just want to make two little comments to this, uh, to the title even of this thing, Belonging in Europe. And I would say there is a tendency of identifying belonging in Europe and belonging in the EU. And uh, it's not only Switzerland, it's all the EFTA states. And if you look at uh, the, the issues that Europe is going to have in the wider world uh, with uh, uh, Ukraine, but also with Turkey, uh, soon with the United Kingdom, um, question mark of Russia, do all these belong to Europe or not? And what does that mean? So I believe that, yes, we in Switzerland, we belong in Europe, no question about that. At the same time, that does not necessarily mean that we belong in the EU, and for reasons. And the reasons are, and this is in the second, in the subtitle, nation state sovereignty, solidarity, I personally am missing one thought, and that is democracy. And uh, so that is the reason why Swiss people, and if you would make a vote in Switzerland, you would get 20% in favor of joining the EU now. The large majority would not want to join the EU. And why? Primarily because they are proud of their direct democracy, and they would see that endangered in a half-democratic entity as the EU is today, because it's not really a democratic system. It's a half-democratic system, and therefore, I believe uh, thoughts of sovereignty in the sense of democracy and that my vote really counts and that I can make decisions and I'm not dependent on somebody else making decisions for me is an important thing that from a Swiss perspective is sort of not really in integrated into this discussion. And then one little thought. The nation states, there is this, this story of saying we have the nation states and then they have gone to a higher level in European integrity and now the danger is that this disintegrates back into nation states. And I owe to Timothy Snyder the thought that when you look more precisely at the European situation that formed the EU, these were all not nation states, but they were failed empires. So this was UK failed empire, was France failed empire, was Italy failed empire, was Germany horribly failed empire. So all these were uh, 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 destroyed empires and they took the European thought in order to move forward. And now Eastern Germany also are the relics of a big failed empire and what, what came out of that empire. And in a sense, they 
the, the Eastern Europeans, and you can see that they use the EU as a transition phase into becoming nation states. And so that uh, maybe if you look at the EU as, a, as, a, as, as, as something that, that was used in a failed empire situation in order to allow those countries to become nation states, then suddenly this gets a totally different, different uh, uh, background. So I don't, I, I don't think it fits in. Um, okay. Um, hi. Um, I was lacking one word uh, when you were talking about uh, the nation state sovereignty and solidarity, uh, Europe, global. And I, don't, I, I wonder whether that word is out of fashion and it's called equality. Uh, I think that we all um, understand equality and uh, we all take it for granted maybe, but um, I think that equality is something that we should consider when talking at least about solidarity because you can be solidary only with, a, with an equal. Uh, if you are uh, not with an equal, then you're charitable. So I think that uh, equality is a word that we should also address and in a, in a, to, to tie it uh, to a previous conversation and to 1989, um, we kind of forgot that uh, the Eastern Europe also had all these things that you mentioned should belong to the European center in between the stars, the empty center. We forgot that we had equality there. We can discuss the, the political situation, but we had equality. We had public, uh, free public uh, schooling. We had free health uh, system. We had all of that and we didn't transfer it into the EU in 1989. Actually, and I don't think it was the Eastern prerogative not to transfer it, it was the Western prerogative not to take it. So I was wondering when we are talking about equality not to uh, use that word only for the identity issues or uh, kind of uh, very um, Western type of things, but to the class issues as well, and to the to the uh, real um, ideals of communism. If if we want to talk about it, it's not debunked. I mean, it has become debunked, but we do have an ideal. We can, uh, yeah, that's it. Um. I just wanted to jump in on something Susan said a while back about how if you had asked Americans before 2016 if they cared about immigration, they wouldn't have. And I don't think that's true. Um, I think what's unusual about the United States is that we're a nation that has a romance about immigration and our delight in receiving immigrants, when in fact we have historically treated them very badly. Um, denying citizenship to people of color well into the 20th century. Um, and I think part of what is at stake um, for the United States in what happens in Europe now is that populists in the United States are looking to Europe <laughs> for models of how to exclude people and the logic for why to exclude people. And that is, in fact, all about culture and it's all about whiteness. Hi, I have another perspective from the United States related to some comments that were made earlier about constructing more inclusive identities in the future for Europe. I think I would like to caution that people should not lean too heavily on the concepts of, first of all, identity, and then secondly, on um, collective remembrance. Um, so in 2016, when I participated for the first time in a presidential election, I was part of a wide ranging group of young people uh, with a variety of different political perspectives. I voted for Hillary Clinton. I was one of the liberals who did that out of conviction and not merely by holding his nose. But I knew other people, people that I was close with who went in the opposite direction. And I had the opportunity to engage with them and ask them what their reasons were for doing that. And the thing that came up most frequently was that they were tired of being accused of implicit racism, implicit homophobia, they were tired of the crimes of colonialism and, um, and imperialism being laid at their feet. 
not not them directly, but they were tired of having to deal with that in a special kind of way because of their identity, their ethnic identity. And so in a sense, I think that what happened in America in 2016 was also because the anti-racism, which became so paradigmatic among the American left, sort of uncorked a bottle. And then out of that, you have, it's okay to be white. That was the narrative that I heard from my friends. And there was another comment that I heard made earlier as well that got me to thinking, which is that on the right, you have largely fictitious manufactured identities that are spurned out and the left has trouble competing with this. I would like to contest that. And this is where my statement turns into a question. It's clear to me that you don't simply have right-wing elites who are manufacturing false identities for personal gain and then the rest of us who actually believe in what we're saying. You have other people who believe in what they're saying but don't buy into what we're saying here. So when you build this more constructive, inclusive identity for Europe, how do you account for those people? Thank you. Okay, because the questions or comments were sort of related, I wanted to say to the person in the back room, of course, uh, America's ideal about immigration has, like every single American ideal, often been undercut by its practice. Um, and, uh, you know, there have been all kinds of immigration laws at various times to, um, you know, make sure that the, uh, or, or to try to ensure that the bulk of the country was white Anglo-Saxon and Protestant. It is still the case that Donald Trump played on the immigration issue and exacerbated it to a degree that no one would have imagined before that. And I want to point out that various people do that. Um, you're asking a you know a, a very large question uh, and very complicated question to which I'm going to make a short attempt, um, and probably the other two panelists would like to do that too. Um, I have heard those claims too, that the, the reason why Donald Trump was elected was because of political correctness, because, uh, I mean, it's the short version of that claim. And uh, I have to say, I have no reason to think it's true looking at statistics, even though I agree that anecdotally, um, you know, you can find people who did that. The larger and more interesting question that you're raising and that's extremely relevant to our thinking about what kinds of ideals we're going to have for Europe is what's the relation to looking at your national crimes and to figuring out some way to build a national identity. I think, you know, so when the New York Times does the 1619 project, Newt Gingrich is, you know, going to throw a fit and say, you're, you're t we're, we will have no basis of national identity if we actually look at our crimes. And this is a point where I actually believe Germany can be a good example, even though uh, nobody was born a German, uh, or very few people who were born a German, uh, would actually admit to it, okay? That is, that there is a process you can go through which involves investigating colonialism, investigating the, uh, not just slavery, but the age of racial terrorism, which is a more appropriate name for Jim Crow once you actually look at the history. Uh, I think all of those things can be examined and at the same time, and this is um, something that Elida Osman touched on a little bit yesterday, at the same time, you can find uh, heroes. It's, I, I, um, I interviewed Brian Stevenson, the wonderful um, civil rights lawyer who built the amazing Montgomery lynching memorial. And one of the things that he talks about is the need uh, not only to remember our crimes, but to remember our heroes. 
okay, and to mark them properly. And I think what you get if you're successful, and it's a long, complicated, ongoing process, uh, you get a grown-up idea of identity in the same way that I think you know, adults need. You start out as a kid, you believe everything your parents said, and possibly when you're a teenager, you reject everything you say. If you're going to have a healthy relationship to your family, you need to sift through those things that you acknowledge and are great for and those things that you re regret. And I think it's a process that we need to do as nations. Um, so I think the point you make about class is, is really important and, um, and it's too rarely made. And I'm not sure that I, I feel like post-1989 communism was certainly tarnished and the notion of socialism was, but I don't know that the notion of equality was. I feel like in a range of ways, the, the you know broad social movements and whatever have, have carried on that track. It's just that it's untethered in a way that it wasn't before. That there's no movement to attach it to. I actually kind of I I I voted Remain, and I consider myself a Eurosceptic. And I I kind of uh, I could understand why Switzerland would not want to join the EU. The one challenge I would make is the notion that they would want to be ind independent and democratic because you're still in a neoliberal global system. There is still a limit to what Swiss democracy can do because whatever you vote for, you have to work within this, you have to work within this system that's kind of going to make a lot of the decisions for you. Um, whether you're in the European Union or out of the European Union, you um, if you're out of it, then obviously you're not involved in that huge superstructure. Um, but whether you're in it or out of it, you're still in the you're still in the world economy, where nation states just have kind of relatively little power compared to massive multinationals. Now, I mean, I I just think that um, well, I guess two things. The first, nobody talked about elites forcing things down people's throats or anything. I mean, nobody said any, any of that. I think that people can absolutely believe these stories about American greatness, about the reason that black people don't get on is because they don't work hard enough, about individual liberty. Um, uh, and some of the things that people believe, whether on the left or the right, can be wrong, just factually untrue. Um, and I think the challenge for the left is to come up with a better story not to kind of say, well, there's, I mean, clearly that story works for enough people. And the left has to come up with a better story. And I do think we have a better story in terms of pluralism and, uh, and so on. But I just want to rest for a moment on this issue of people being blamed for things that they didn't do. In Britain, in England in particular, people will say, we won the World Cup, even if they didn't play. They'll say, we won the war, even if they didn't fight. But nobody enslaved anyone. Nobody raped anyone. Nobody invaded anywhere. And so when it comes to individual identities, people say, well, that wasn't me. Unless it's something really good that they want to attach themselves to. And then they say, we're the greatest nation on earth. But I didn't napalm anyone. It's not possible. And in that way, then, power has many parents, and the brutality that it takes to acquire it is always an orphan. You can never find It's why Black History Month is generally told in the passive voice. Rosa Parks was kicked off a bus. People were denied. Well, somebody did that. And actually a system supported them doing that. Now, I'm not interested in individuals' guilt. There are therapists for that. But I am interested in systemic redress. And if people are offended by that, then so be it. If it's tiresome for them to have to hear how um, things have been acquired, sometimes in their name, then if it's tiresome for them, imagine how tiresome it must be if you're one of the people who's had those things taken from you. So, um, so I don't mind. I don't mind when people say, you know, why are you bringing up old stuff? Because it's only old. The Brits will go back to 1066 to tell you when they were last invaded. But if you talk to them about Kenya, 
in the 70s. They're like, why are you talking about old stuff? That was ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the questions of, uh, uh, about equality and identity, they're, they, they're key, they're interconnected, uh, and they go to the, to the heart of um, the malaise uh, of the left. So I, the, what you heard, um, what you're hearing now, it's look, it looks like the pendulum is swinging back. So you hear, for instance, Samuel Moyne saying that... Um, not enough, that uh, human rights is a kind of a game that uh, neoliberals played during the 90s, uh, but it w when it comes to uh, economic redistribution and, 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 and tough realpolitik, um, they're not willing to do that. So let's, let's be careful to avoid playing, playing that game. You hear uh, post-Trump, you heard a lot of remorse among um, American leftists, who had a, a long and, and uh, virulent postmodernist, post-structuralist phase, um, basically saying that, uh, oh my, we, we kind of forgot about the people in West Virginia, we started fighting, uh, our battles became ever smaller and more differentiated, you know, the, uh, the, the cliche is transgender toilets, so we fought for that, but we forgot that some people are really hurting in, 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 in West Virginia. Uh, plus, you've got um, the argument that um, that right wing, let's call it right wing populism for a moment, um, in lack of a better term, right wing populism in many ways is the right playing identity politics games, right? Um, now, I, th I think the w if that debate is framed that way, I, I always I think uh, part of that is a is is a lie uh, because. Um, these terms are not mutually exclusive and the battles are not mutually exclusive. So uh, if somebody transgender is much more likely to be poor as well. So there's very real uh, intersectionality that becomes operative in people's lives, right? So, so that's, that's part of the story. The, the, the debate shouldn't be framed in terms that are um, dichotomous. But... Um, Having said that, I'm just uh, also uh, at a loss and, and, and wrestling with this issue of how to best balance a sort of um, uh, difference, uh, uh, particularly in the universal. Let's call it very broad brushstrokes, particularly in the universal. And I don't have a good answer. I, I relapse into, into metaphors like dialectics, uh, et cetera. But I, I don't know. I think it's one of the key issues that's uh, uh, at the heart of where we are today. Okay, so please let me, uh, help me um, thank our wonderful panelists and thank you all for participating in this conversation.